Hey, good morning, everyone. To Tanya Live, Sharbat Tachan Live. Actually, today it's going to be neither. We're going to reflect on a very important concept in Judaism. And I'm wondering how many of you out there uh, sort of identify with this Mida, with this trait. So before we get to that, let me say hello to everyone who's slowly going to be getting on. Say good morning to everyone. Please tell us where you are watching from, and then we'll get on with our Tehillim. Okay, Tov, good morning. Please give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, Tov, everybody. I can see faces, so just let me know who you are. Ah, good morning, Carol. Yes, you've been away for a while, Carol, and I missed you, so I'm glad you're back. Can you hear me well? Can you hear me clearly? Hi. Yeah? Good morning, Corinne. Mazel tov to you again on the beautiful, beautiful Bar Mitzvah. Welcome, Joanne. Good to see you recently. Hope to see you more. And everyone can hear me, so that's good. Okay. How's everyone feeling on this gorgeous September morning? Hi, Joanne. How are you? So good to see you, at least virtually. Okay, so now that everyone's getting on, hi Esther, good morning Helga. Hope everyone had a beautiful Shabbos. And uh, yes, we're wishing Corinne and Sharon Otis, actually Mazel Tov, on their gorgeous grandson, who did a spectacular job, not a job. He did a beautiful Kriyas HaTorah in Shul. He spoke beautifully, and you should just continue having a lot of Yiddish Shanachis from him. So on behalf of all of us, wishing you a mazel tov, Kareen. Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's start off with giving tzedakah. Take a coin, put it into a charity box. By the way, this is a mitzvah that we should do every single day. Easiest mitzvah in the world. Wake up in the morning after you wash your hands, put a coin into the tzedakah box. A nickel is good. Just the act of giving is very, very important. So. Make sure we get that in place before we start. We're going to say Tehillim now. Shoshana bas Sara, Moshe ben Leia Esther, Devara bas Rezel, Chaya, Rachel bas Vega, Reb Yitzchak ben Chana Leia, Leia bas Spasia. Please feel free to put down anyone who needs uh, Rufu Shlema. Uh, anyone? Hi, Francis. Good morning. Good to see you, Francis, last week. Mazel tov on your Simcha as well, right? It was a Ramit Sanchal. Yeah, the shul's, shul's been happening. Every week there's been a bar mitzvah. It's unbelievable. It's very exciting. And in fact, okay, we're going to say to Hillel, and then I want to tell you about something incredible, really, really, for me, quite earth-shattering that happened this morning. So we'll start off with chapter Chaf. Yiskar kom le chasecha valascha yidash ne sela. Yiten le chacha vavecha vecholat satcha yimale. Yirana beshu secha u beshem elohenu niko. Yimale adinai kom le chala secha. Ati adati ki yashi adinai mishicho. Yane mishme kotcha begrua si yashi mino. Ela varecha ve ela asusa manachna beshem adinai elohenu naskir. Hema karu vena follow vanachnu kamnu vanis odan. And say it together with me. Adonai Hoshia Hamelach Yanenu Viyom Karenu. Good morning, Lital. Good morning, Francis. So, what happened this morning that is earth shattering for me? Well, Toby Bernstein, Shlucha et Chabad Romano, Sarah Lowenthal, incredible, uh, very dynamic educator from Toronto. And myself, we opened our doors for Tamim Academy. This is the first Tamim Academy in Canada. There are 10 branches in North America. We were chosen to be the first because I guess the directors and philanthropists came here to visit and saw that uh, the way we run our preschools, that's Torah Tats and Gan Shalom, um, are on very high standard. And they trusted us to open their first Academy. So what is Tamim Academy? It is a Chabad-inspired day school. Now, many of you know, unfortunately, York Region suffered tremendous blow the last few years 
We closed a high school. We closed two day schools. Two day schools that had 1,000 children in each school. Hi, Elise. Good morning. Good morning, Rosalie. Two day schools that many of you have sent your kids there. Broke. One of the day schools was literally smashed to the ground and is being replaced by townhouses. The other one is empty now, full of non-Jewish day schools. And to me, it's like a Chorban Beit HaMikdash. How do you close day schools in Thornhill, York region, that is bursting with Jewish children? If anybody has an answer, feel, please feel free to put that into the comments. But regardless, there was something lacking in those schools, which I will not name, lacking in those schools that couldn't keep the children in its doors. Something wrong with maybe the executives, maybe with administration, wasn't coming across that the children, Jewish children belong. Children, children, Jewish children must have a Jewish education. And so we felt, in fact, it was my husband and Mary Bernstein together with us, um, huge expense, you can imagine what a day school costs to run. But we do have backing of some philanthropists here in Thornhill. Some of them might be actually watching right now. Huge thank you. And through philanthropists in New York City who are putting in hundreds of thousands of dollars to make sure that our Chabad Inspired Day School, which has an extremely high level secular education beyond the anterior curriculum and a very high Jewish education with a Hebrew teacher present all day, so the children will have Hebrew immersion throughout the school day. Our teacher-child ratio was very low. And in fact, I'm proud to say that we now have a waiting list. You heard me correct. We already have children who want to come in. Our doors are closed. We unfortunately do not space. And so we are starting our wait list. Next year, we will be moving, God willing, most probably into the JCC on Lubavitch Drive so we can expand and grow. We will have swimming pools, basketball courts, playgrounds, art rooms, so that, Torah, to, uh, so that Ta Tamim Academy will become the destination for children and for parents who want authentic Judaism with the Chabad-inspired. What is Chabad-inspired? It means it has passionate teachers, principals, and educators. Our money is not going for million dollar administration. It's going for the children. And you know, Toby and myself, we are running a Chabad preschools here, Chabad centers. We don't take a salary for this Tamim. We are out there to make sure that every Jewish child in New York region gets a Jewish education. And we know by next year it will be doubled and it will be tripled and we know we're gonna have to expand, but we're not having crazy overheads. We are going to make this fiscally responsible so that every Jewish child. So that's why I'm on a high. I know, Carol, it was heartbreaking watching the school come down on Atkinson. It is very heartbreaking. And we attempt to change that. So please give me your blessings. In fact, this morning, I took pictures of all the Tamim children with their uniforms. There's a special, it's just gorgeous. Our children are gonna have Uniforms, special kippot, special pants and shirts, sweaters with our logo. Tamim stands for complete. Tamim im Hashem alokecha. It's, a, it's a, a phrase in our tradition that one should walk wholeheartedly and truthfully, purposefully with Yerushalayim, with Hashem in front of us. A school that's going to be passionate about the Yiddishkeit, passionate about Ben Adam the Chavero, friend to friend, kindness, compassion, beauty, validation, empathy will be the way our teachers, our children, and our parents. We had an open house a few weeks ago, which was remarkable. The parents were so passionate about our philosophy and our goals. Uh, we flew in a teacher from Israel to be the Israeli um, shlucha 
so that there's someone who's very Zionistic on site at all times to make our children passionate about Eretz HaKodesh, about Israel. And our teachers live and breathe what they teach. They don't teach Chumash and Tanakh and then they go out at home and do their own thing. They are walking examples of honesty, integrity, compassion. I know I'm selling this school, but I am on a high. I, ran, I literally ran this morning, said good morning, and ran back to do this class. So you can see um, I'm excited. Today's class is going to be focusing on a special time of the year we are in now. Does anybody know what is the month, the Jewish month that we are currently in right now? Put that in the show. How come you put just water. <laughs> Anybody know what's the Hebrew month right now? Put it into the comments. You know me, I like feedback. Okay, so what is the name of the month? Thank you, Francis. We are the month of Elul. Elul is the month of Ani Lidodi, Vidodi Lim. We are to Hashem, Hashem is to us. This is the month that we are preparing for what? What are we preparing for, guys? We are preparing for something very extraordinary. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Corinne. You are great this morning. Everyone's really on the button. You're all fast. What is the holiday that immediately follows the month of Elul, the next day? And in fact, it's exactly 20 days from today. Yikes. Anybody know? Rosh Hashanah. And what happens in Rosh Hashanah, my friends? What happens in Rosh Hashanah? Besides all of us coming to show, wishing each other Shana Tova, putting apples and honey on the table, eating round fruits, many customs to eat the head of the fish. We are going to hear the shofar twice. But what else is taking place more spiritually, more than what we're doing? So Francis, you're right. So it's a time for us to reflect. And what is God doing? What is God doing in Rosh Hashanah? We're reflecting. We are praying. We are listening to the shofar. We're eating special foods. We're probably dressing a certain way. What is God doing on Rosh Hashanah? Hashem, yes, it's introspection. But Hashem is doing something on this day. It's very important for us to be aware of this takes us into a different mode. What else is happening on Rosh Hashanah? What is God doing on Rosh Hashanah? Oh, Hashem is judging us. And God willing, he writes us into the book of life. So I'm going to give a little um, she or today on how we prepare ourselves for the day of judgment. Right? Yom Hazikaron, the day of remembrance, which leads us to Yom Hadin, the day of judgment. When Hashem looks at us and wants to judge us for the year that just passed, we're told that Hashem judges us the way we judge others. Now let me throw out a question to you. You could be honest or you could abstain. How do you judge others? So for example, if you are supposed to be going out tonight with your spouse and he comes an hour late, how do you react to his tardiness? Do you A, judge him that he is just so forgetful and he always forgets his wife and you are second class? B, do you think, oh my God, something terrible must have happened and this is terrible and I'm frightened to hear what happened. We've got a car accident and this is horrible. Number three, you do Dan Lekafskot. What is Dan Lekafskot? Anybody ever heard of that phrase? Dan Lekafskot. Do you judge him favorably? I'll give you another scenario. Your child was home from university, 
and comes in and leaves all his laundry lying on the floor right when you walk in, you nearly trip. Do you think, what a loser? Oh my gosh, his child can't even get his act together. He just doesn't, he disregards his mother totally. Or C, my child is probably so happy to come home, so exhausted, so stressed, didn't realize that he left the laundry here. I'll judge him favorably. What does it mean, done? The Scott. Good morning, Leia. Good morning, Nora. Dan Lakapskos means to judge others favorably. And on Rosh Hashanah, Hashem judges us for the entire year of action, our entire year of behavior. So now this is the thing. We're told that Hashem judges us the way we judge others. So if we judge others favorably with the right eye, does that mean that Hashem is going to judge us the same way? And we all know none of us are perfect. We sometimes speak Russian Hara, we sometimes have very negative thoughts, negative speech, negative actions. We disrespect, disregard, disillusion, a lot of disses, right? Is that how Hashem is going to look at us? Disengaged. Hashem doesn't care. He judges and says, look at her. She never showed up to show all year. Look how she treated her mother. Look what she spoke about her sister. Could you believe how she acted to her friend? She knew so-and-so was in the hospital. She knew this one needed help. And God looks at our actions. And so what does Hashem look at our actions and how does he judge us? Now, this is something that's very interesting. Because when you go to court here, any court, anywhere around the world, the judge looks actually at the person, the way he comes up into the court case. So if someone comes to court and the judge sees an action, he hears the, the, the two points of view, And based on what God, the judge sees is how he comes up with the verdict, right? No matter how the accused looks, he can shed a river of tears. But to the judge, he doesn't know if you are genuine. He looks at what the two lawyers bring to the stand and he bases it on what he hears. He only can see what the eye can see, that's an earthly judge, right? He can't give clemency if the law is the law. What do you do? The law is the law. There's no room for clemency. But a heavenly judge, our God, comes to us in Rosh Hashanah. We come to him, Rosh Hashanah. We put it all out there, and we do have tears of remorse. And we do have the ability to do tshuva. And even if we did not judge others favorably, Hashem sees our remorse. Hashem sees that we are doing tshuva. And one of the ways we do tshuva is that we promise to be dan l'kaf schus, to judge others favorably. And when God sees that, and he sees that this is how we have been reacting and acting to others. Then Hashem says, well, kamayim upon upon him. This is the way I got to judge this girl. This is the way I got to judge that guy. This is the way I got to judge that son or that daughter. They have remorse. Or they lived a life where they judged others favorably. I want to share with you a story that really reflects just a very short, but very honest anecdote of how we can, hey, good morning, Deborah, of how we can judge others. So this Yemenite rabbi shows up to a very, very wealthy philanthropist in New York. And he says to him, you know, Mr. George, so-and-so, it's a true story, by the way. He goes, I am raising money for a yeshiva that supports Yemenite 
boys and girls studying. And we are very poor. Our community is very poor. Unfortunately, Israel doesn't give us enough. And not only are we dealing with refugees who don't have basic necessities, I want to give them a school where they can learn to be good Jews, where they can learn how it means to be successful in life. And I need to empower them and I need funding. So this American Jew is listening and he goes, you know, I really, I really like the way it sounds. I like what you're doing. He says, do me a favor, just wait in my waiting room and, you know, feel free to wait a few minutes. I will think about how much I want to give. So being this Yemenite Jew is a Rosh Yeshiva, he's the head of Yeshiva, he always carried a Gemara with him. So he takes the Gemara, and instead of opening it up the correct way, he begins to read it backwards. American Jew is not impressed. He's watching how this Yemenite guy, this Yemenite Rosh Yeshiva, is learning the Talmud backwards. In other words, upside down. You know, sometimes I go to show them and I have guests who walk into our show. They have a, no clue what to do. And I'll see them sitting there with a sidra like this. And I just gently walk over and I turn it around and I show them the place. I mean, there's some Jews that are so far off, they don't even know how to open a sidra. I mean, they could open any math book or any novel, but a sidra, a chumash, they don't have. And so that's what this guy was doing. He was opening it backwards. The American Jew was very, very, very perturbed, very turned off. He's watching. I mean, he's an American philanthropist, but he knows the Talmud. And he walks in to the waiting room. He says, you know what, Rabbi? I decided I'm not going to give you anything. What? What just happened? What just happened between me and you? Like, we just... A second ago, you were giving me a check, and now I'm in the waiting room, and you changed your mind. What did I just do? He says to him, you know what? I don't want to even give you an answer. And he walks back into the office. The rabbi is devastated. He was so expecting a beautiful charity and a gracious check. He goes, oh, my gosh, what just happened? He banged on the door. He said, please, please. Tell me what I did wrong. I, I want to apologize. It's not fear that all these Yemenite children will not be able to be educated because of something that I did wrong. Okay, fine, you don't want to give me a check, but just tell me what I do wrong. And he said to him, you are a hoax. You walked into that waiting room, pulled out a Talmud, proceeded to learn from it upside down, and I'm supposed to think that you are the real deal, you don't even know how old a Talmud. So the Yemenite rabbi starts to laugh. He's hilariously laughing. He says, oh my gosh, let me explain. He says, back at home, where we come from, I come from a very, very, very poor town. And when I was a young child, we had maybe two Talmuds for the entire class. And so when we were young, we began to learn Talmud from four directions because there would be many boys sitting around one Talmud. One boy learned to read it the correct way. Another boy had to learn to read it upside down. The boy on the right had to read it sideways. And the boy on the left had to read it this way. And we became proficient in learning Talmud upside down. In fact, today, when I learn Talmud, I read it upside down. The American rabbi hits his head and he goes, oh my gosh. So this is what it, what, this is what it means, dan l'kaf schus, to judge another favorably. I thought you were a hoax. I thought you were full of baloney. And here I misjudged you totally. Let me ask you, my friends, let's be honest, because it's the month of El. It's a month of the Melech Basadeh, the king is in the field. And when the king is in the field, we have to change our behaviors, start reflecting on tshuva. Like you said before, God is looking at us, 
he's going to be getting ready for judging us. But the king is in the field, which means that God is very approachable. Has anybody here ever heard the term Hamelach Basadeh? If you did, put it into the chat or put it into the comments. What does it mean? Hamelach Basadeh. This is an expression that was coined by the Alter Rebbe when he was teaching his Hasidim, his students, the way we have to look at Elul. Do we look at the month of Elul as a month of fear, as a month of distance, as a month of worry? <gasps> oh my gosh, it's Elul, Rosh Hashanah is almost here, I'm freaking out. Or do we look at it as Hamelech Basadeh? The king is in the field. Anybody know what that means? What does it mean? Hamelech Basadeh, the king is in the field. What does it mean? I'm not sure anyone can hear me. Can you hear me, guys? Can you give me a thumbs up if you hear me? I'm not getting any interaction. I'm getting a little bit worried that I'm not being heard. Can anyone hear me? Okay, good. Okay, excellent. Okay. So what does it mean, Hamelech Basadeh? The king is in the field. So this is something that Hasidus teaches us that is very, very, very important. Thank you, Elise. Hamelech Basadeh means that the king, our God, is out in the field and approachable. You know, if you want to go speak to the king of Morocco or the queen of England, let's take it for example, or the prime minister, how many people would you have to go to to approach that king? You would have to speak to your MPP, your MP. You would have to speak to the people at the parliament. You have to go through so much clearance until you got, and then you probably couldn't get through anyway. The same thing is with Queen of England. I mean, I was in England a few months, years ago, and I was able to see the queen from behind the fence when the queen was driven through the, I couldn't get close to the queen. But in Elo, Hashem, our king, is close, which means we can now make revisions and we can change our status by making new resolutions. And Hashem is here and he sees us and he wants us to have a connection. So during the month of Elo, is something, I want to just tell you something personally that I am doing and you can feel free to join me. Most of you already do this, but there are times in my mind that I'm not always down the cups. Is it just me? Is it just me? I sometimes do not. I don't know. And then I started learning about the parsha because this talk, we talk about a lot about Shotrim and Shoftim, the judging. And I really sat down and I meditated on how am I preparing for Rosh Hashanah. The Melech Basada, the kings in the field, Elul, it's a month, of, a month of preparing, getting ready, excited. It's not just about my recipes. Believe me, I'm not just, I know Elise, I'm not just thinking about my recipes and what kind of roasts and chickens. That's really, I do that, but that's not my focus of Elul. My focus of Elul is how to improve myself. And one of the ways I'm going to start is by being done and I want to give you a secret, just a very interesting matter of fact secret. When you judge everyone, your spouse, your children, your brother-in-law, sister-in-laws, neighbors, friends, community, colleagues, a negative thought comes into mind. And if you just say these words, Dan something magical happens you actually become very relaxed and zero anxiety because you judge in favor. Whatever happened was supposed to happen. There was a reason, a good reason. You just judged in favor. Maybe there was an oversight. Maybe they didn't realize. Maybe they're going through a stressful day. Maybe, oh, oh, that's so cute. Maybe you are, um, you know, maybe you're being too harsh. Maybe you're being too you know, resentful or, or judgmental yourself. Being down the kafskos literally takes off anxiety, stress, 
needless worry that nobody needs in our life today. So our message today is Dan Lekafskos to others. And I'll give you a little story of something that I once did with students when I was teaching in New York. I took a white plate and I put a little black hole. And I said to my students, what do you see? And one student said, I see a black hole. Another one said, I see a shooting range. And another child said, I see damaged goods. And one child said, I see a white plate with a little black dot. We have to challenge ourselves for the next 20 days until Rosh Hashanah to be done the Kaskos. See the white plate. Let's not focus on the little black spot. With enough Pitachan, we could be sure that nothing bad could ever happen to us because Hashem is in charge of everything, of everyone. Everything is meant to be, it will be good. And I'm wishing you all, and that's how you have to, by the way, when you see a friend, just end off with, Ketiva v'chazima tova, a good gebenched I'm wishing you all, Shana tova, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.